always very important for me to, to remind us all of what this company is about. Our purpose is about our mining improves lives. Um, it's underpinned by our CARES values, uh, commitment, accountability, respect, enabling and safe production. Our vision is about creating superior value creation, um, well, our vision is superior value creation for all stakeholders. Um, as I always say, today's focus is mainly on shareholders and investors and, uh, and in fact I think important to highlight our lenders um, by mining and beneficiating our mineral resources. Uh, our tree finds a lot of favour um, all across the world um, and in, in very different jurisdictions to just mining. Um, with our values embedded in the roots, the, the, our people, most important asset in the business, um, supporting and giving the tree direction, uh, profitability and sustainability key, a healthy tree, good canopy, um, and you see it, uh, you see all the stakeholders that then benefit and you actually even see the fruit. So that's how we think, that's how we make decisions, um, and, uh, and that's what we've done since 2014. <clears throat> All right, safe production is, is critical. Um, uh, you will see that it, it had a huge impact in 2018. I'd go as far as to say it nearly put us out of business. Um, we, we shared with you in a lot more detail than I'm going to do today the action plans we, we put in place. Um, and there were a number of short-term interventions, which are all the interventions that all mining companies do. And, um, and then we, we started thinking long term, term about sustainability of, uh, and, and, and real improvement uh, from the levels that the industry has got to. We, we've, we've raised the issue of uh, having reached a plateau in the industry. I'm very pleased to say that um, as a group we achieved six and a half million uh, fatality free shifts. Um, the South African region was by far the majority of that. 6.3 million, gold, um, 3.2 million, and SAPGMs, uh, another 4 million. That, those, those are record uh, achievements for our companies, and many, many companies don't get anywhere near that. To put it in perspective, um, if, if this was our, just our U.S. business, it would mean zero fatalities from 2007, 2006, 2007. Um, so, so, in fact, our South African business, we can, we can say, is operating at least as safe, if not safer, than our U.S. business. And it shows in injury rates as well. I think, as, a, as an international company as well, we have to take cognizance of the recent uh, tailings dam failure in Brazil. We have, on our own back, instituted a number of uh, audits. Um, to, to make sure that our own processes and procedures are being adhered to. We're reviewing designs of our facilities. But I also know, having been, been at the forefront of some, some unusual accidents, we also need to wait and, and understand what the actual mechanism of failure in Brazil was before we all have knee-jerk reactions, which uh, may not add value. But clearly we take that very seriously and, uh, and, and we have instituted the actions I've just described. <clears throat> There's our, our group safety statistics and, um, and very pleasing to see um, the rates have come down, um, especially the fatal injury frequency rate in the second half of the year to the lowest ever. Um, as I say, um, we, we have gone more than four months uh, without a, out a fatal, which, in, which, which is really a very pleasing achievement. All right, operational results. Um, I think it's safe to say um, our U.S. and South African uh, PGM operations had, I don't want to say blowout performance, but another year of, of really good, solid delivery, both on the, um, the output side and, uh, and the cost side. Um, record production from East Boulder in the U.S. and Kroondal in South Africa. And remember, Kroondal was always a, a very well-managed company, and uh, I'm very pleased that we've been able to, to even do better. 
Uh, EBITDA, and let me say at this point that uh, uh, we've had such a disruptive year in gold that uh, looking backwards almost is, is, is a waste of time. Um, but nevertheless, it's important that we fix up the issues that, uh, that caused the underperformance. And it's not in the PGMs, it's in the gold, and I'll get to that. But adjusted EBITDA, very similar to the previous year. Um, but important to note that 84% of the EBITDA came out of PGMs. Um, even in a year when the PGM basket price was, uh, was not uh, where it is today. Um, headline loss, you can see the numbers. Um, um, significant uh, improvement uh, from 2017, despite it being a very, a very difficult year. Basic loss of two and a half billion. I must tell you, there's so many uh, non-cash numbers in that, uh, and Charles will go through um, the complexities of including streams and uh, and buying back bonds. Um, it's incredibly complex, uh, but again, it's uh, you know year on year an improvement, still a loss. Not acceptable, and certainly not results that we're proud of, um, other than what our PGM business is doing. Financial flexibility has certainly been enhanced, and again, um, we've taken early steps, um, um, such as uh, resizing and uh, upsizing our, our dollar facilities, uh, RCF facilities to 600 million. The $500 million streaming transaction, we, we're still very pleased with. Uh, our net debt to EBITDA ratio is unfortunately, it is down, but it's still at two and a half. But it's, it's because of our gold business. We understand exactly why it's not one and a half, as an example. Um, extension of our covenants, because we've, uh, and I want to say it publicly, we've, we really appreciate the support we've got from our lenders. They, they understand the, the underlying quality of our business and they understand the future cash flows very well. Of course, that's their business, but they also understand and support us for what we, what we are taking on at the moment in terms of strikes and, and other changes to, to our, our income stream, which we'll discuss uh, in a bit more detail. So uh, covenants have, have been raised to give us more headroom, not, uh, not as a concern of our models not working. And then, in addition, we, we've got a covenant holiday for March uh, for two reasons. The one is we're not going to be intimidated by threats of, uh, uh, you know, ongoing strikes and unreasonable positions. Um, but we also have a change from a, a purchase of concentrate agreement in South Africa to a toll treatment contract, and it impacts the first quarter. We're going to give you that information so you're not surprised uh, when you see our next operating update. Successful strategic progress. The DRD transaction was concluded, and uh, um, we, we now have consolidated that from 1 August. Um, we still have the option to go to control, and uh, we have all intents, uh, in, we have good intentions to do that. Um, Altan Alberan transaction was completed in November 2018. And that is part of the deleveraging ex exercise as well, but it's also doing it in a smart way that we retain exposure. That was our copper gold asset in South America. And the Lonman acquisition is advancing to completion. I'm very confident it will close. And a number of significant conditions have been uh, satisfied uh, since we last spoke. The financial evolution is, is very clear on this graph. There's probably a couple of key takeaways. Um, you can see how the gold uh, EBITDA profile is so dependent on exchange rates. And you can see that from Q1 2018, um, our gold division underperformed. The, the EBITDA in, in Q2 was probably below where it should have been, remembering that that's where we started having uh, a number of these uh, um, fatal uh, uh, or safety issues, these, uh, these disruptions, these operational disruptions. Q3 was the knock-on effect of those, um, and then Q4 was impacted uh, pr predominantly by the strike. Um, so, so we're not sitting here saying everything's fine. There's a lot of work to do in gold, and in fact, um, um, you can see we've listed it on the site. Safety incidents, we need to address safety. I think we've, 
We've, we've shown you how we've done that. We've got unprofitable business units at Beatrix One Shaft and a couple of the Driefontein Shafts. Shadwick is going to talk you through that. And then the AMCU strike. So we need to address those three things to get our gold business back on track. Um, what's also important is just look at the quarter-on-quarter -quarter change in EBITDA from in the, in the PGM sector at, in South Africa and in the U.S. You can see even with the small changes before it really became, let's say, visible, the, 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 the changes in the basket price over that, that period have almost doubled the EBITDA quarter on quarter in the PGM sector. So we will try and give you some, some idea of what the current basket prices are doing uh, um, at spot at the moment uh, to, to our earnings profile um, in the rest of the presentation. I'm not going to go through this in, in detail other than to say if we're going to fix up our gold business, and of course it's important for operating safely in our, um, in our other businesses. This is the, the long-term strategic plan that we've de developed and it's, it's about um, engaged leadership with strong values um, that are understood and used as decision-making throughout the organization. So it's about empowered people. It's about creating a risk a much lower risk environment and then ensuring we, we've got the best systems um, to, to operate in and provide us with leading indicators much more than just lagging indicators. So I think, I think we, we can say we're on the right path with safety. In terms of our business, and I'm not going to go through the 189 process in detail, this is, this is really for Shadwick. Um, we have launched a 189 process, and one of the biggest questions we get overseas is you guys can't restructure. Well, I'm telling you it's our legal right to restructure, but you better do it in a sensitive way. Um, you would notice that we, we engaged in a proper manner with government, and, uh, and if you use a 189 as a process that is about re avoiding retrenchments and having open minds to solutions, you will get it done. Um, Unfortunately, you have to list the number of people that are affected. Now, let, let me tell you, someone that is affected may be someone that you're going to transfer to another business unit. That's an affected person. Um, people, ultimately, there, there are people that lose their jobs, and those are the real affected people. But in terms of announcing it, you have to announce it in this manner. Um, so I'm confident we'll get that done. Lots of noise and rhetoric around it, but it's is the only way you can run a company. The other, the other criticism we've had is that we are, uh, t we, the, the executive is, is actually too thin, too thinly spread. And, um, and, and listen, we take note of those comments. And uh, as an executive, we have recognized that our business is going to change. And, um, and we need to be ready for that change. The one change that's going to happen is that Lonman is going to provide a very large uh, additional operating foot footprint to our, our South African PGM base. It is not possible to run South Africa as a region anymore, and, um, and Robert is, is going to move from running the entire region to being focused on the South African PGM division which is going to include Lonman when it's, uh, when it's uh, completed. And uh, his primary role will be, be to keep the operations running safely and, uh, and of course, integrating Lonman and ensuring that we, we realize the synergies. Uh, so Rob, Robert will have a team um, that will assist him to do it. But also to fix up our gold business and go through the complete the strike, go through the 189 process, and then get back into... Steady state production needs very distinct and separate focus. And uh, I'm very pleased to announce that uh, Shadwick Bissett uh, has joined the executive team. I'll go through the executive team. Um, and, um, and his focus will, will, will be on gold. And um, he will be presenting the gold results today, which uh, um, he was not really part of. Um, but Shadwick will be presenting the gold results today to give you some idea of who Shadwick is and the depth of management that we have within Sabanya Stillwater. The U.S. will continue to operate under Chris's uh, guidance um, 
as is and has been. So, so we're improving management uh, focus at executive level and we're actually positioning the business for, for, for what's going to be required in the future. So there's our team, um, you know, you know, Shalwell, Temba, Temba's here today. Um, um, he's going to head up corporate affairs. Um, Richard, you know well from business development. Hartley's also here. He's going to head up uh, legal and compliance. Chris, you know well. Robert, you know well. As I say, welcome Shadwick to, to our executive team. Wayne, you know well. Wayne is, is, um, is a quiet guy in the operations. We're going to set up a a centralized technical function um, and uh, and we expect to get a lot of value out of that especially with respect to technology and other initiatives and then Darby who did the the value moment this morning is is really going to help us um, create leaders and an organization that is ready for for being part of the new the new world mining uh, companies all right, um, at this stage, I'm going to hand over to Chris, uh, who will talk us through the U.S., and then Chris, if you can hand over to, to Rob, and then Rob to Shadwick, Shadwick to Shaw, who's going to do the financials, and then I'll do a strategic update. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, and good morning. Um, I think uh, in front of you, you've got the US uh, PGM operations slide. As you can see, um, 2017 is an eight-month period um, in that that's when uh, Sabania purchased Stillwater Mining. And we've seen a strong growth in ounces. On an absolute year-to-year -year basis, it's about an 8% in growth, growth in ounces coming on from, uh, from the Blitz production uh, at the Stillwater mine, but we've also had a record performance at East Boulder. So East Boulder produced uh, more ounces in, in the last year than, than they've done to date. I'll talk a little later around uh, what we hope to do at, or what we're planning to do at East Boulder going forward. 2018 guidance was 580 to 610, so we came right in the middle of, uh, of the production guidance. This chart shows the adjusted EBITDA and ASIC. Um, uh, from an EBITDA perspective, we produced just around half of the group's EBITDA on the back of solid performance, but obviously uh, we've seen a very strong rally in the palladium price, which has continued to rally even more significantly than the numbers you see there. Q3, we had a little bit of a dip in pricing, so the average realized price in the first half and the second half isn't that... Uh, big of a difference, 996 in, in H1, we had 1016 in H2. We're st sitting today around 1350 in terms of prices. And even if you run it at 1259, the column on the right shows what the EBITDA in the second half would have been at a price roughly $100 below what we're sitting at today. So we're anticipating good, strong, continued performance in the US on the back of uh, on strong palladium prices, but we are seeing a bit of a, an improvement also in the platinum price. On the recycling operations, you'll see a drop in ounces uh, this year, but an increase in profitability. That was a very deliberate uh, strategy. We're seeing more and more diesel catalysts coming into the recycling stream. That contains silica carbide. Silica carbide causes problems in the furnaces. So we've had a deliberate strategy of putting uh, constraints on the amount of silica carbide we, uh, we process, but also pushing up on the margins, pushing the margins up on those business. So despite a slight drop in ounces fed through the system, um, we saw a good increase in earnings before taxes. Um, we do have an interest income element to that, which is why you see EB. Uh, TDA as opposed to the normal EBITDA. Um, we continue to see growth in terms of the recycling business as a whole and we are working on ways to address this high silica carbide so we're firmly committed to this business. While it's low margin we turn that money over 
four or five times a year. So while you might have a three, four percent margin on that, you're turning your capital over several times. So it's a, it's a good business to be in and it doesn't have price risk. We do not take price risk in that. Anything that we purchase, we forward sell to make sure that it's really a, a fixed margin business. Um, the last thing I'm going to talk about here is uh, we presented just recently a capital project. Uh, for those of you that were on the site visit, you know that we've got uh, excess capacity, if you like, at the, at the East Boulder side, particularly in the concentrator and the material handling. So what this really looks to do is push further development, and it's the majority of the cost is actually normal mine development, open up a new ventilation area so that we can increase ventilation, and there will obviously be some equipment purchases to support that. We've got flexibility on timing of this. The bulk of the month spend, the 19 million of capital, will be spent in 2020. So if we need to slow it down or speed it up, as we look at the other cash requirements across the group, we do have flexibility. Um, it has extremely robust uh, economics. It's about an 88% uh, return um, using a, 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 a basket price of 1025. So again, if you look at today's basket price of 1350, these, uh, the IRR would go up even further. So 106 million at a 5% real discount rate is, is what we've modeled there in terms of NPV. And with that, um, I'll pass over to, to Rob. You can press that on the arrow. <clears throat> Morning, everybody. I'm pleased to be able to say that um, we had another very good year at the SAPGM operations. Um, we have exceeded or done better than um, our production guidance as well as our cost guidance. At, at, at um, Crindle, the guys had an exceptional year. It was, in fact, their best year ever. Mimosa, the production was consistent. Platinum mild production was slightly lower than what it was the previous year. Um, but remember, platinum mild treats the tailings from Rustenburg. So they were negatively impacted by the improved recoveries at the Rustenburg section. And then as you can see, Rustenburg is slightly down in the previous year. Rustenburg treated less surface material in 2018. And we were also affected by a slow startup after the Kusileke incident, safety incident in the beginning of the year. A successful operational turnaround has been achieved at the PGM operations. This graph shows how leveraged the SAPGM operations are to a higher rand 4E PGM basket price. On the left hand axis is EBITDA in terms of rands million. On the right hand axis is rands per 4E ounce. And we can see that over the last two and a half years, at a steady 600,000 ounces per annum, the adjusted EBITDA has actually gone up by more than six times. Um, in closing, just above the solid, relatively flat solid um, cost line is, is, is the average 4E basket price um, for the period indicated on the slide. So you can see relatively or actually very nice margins and, and, and the gearing quite nicely on this slide. Thank you. Shadwick? The right hand. Morning, everybody. Oh, it's nice and quick, eh? As Neil has said, look, the gold operations have had a very challenging year for 2018. But I suppose it's about how we respond to that and how we stand up and be, be counted that, uh, that makes the difference. And at this stage, I think I need to give credit to the, the gold team and how they have responded in the second half of the year as far as safety is concerned. And you probably didn't see it in the graph, but it was a nice turnaround in the second half as far as, far as our safety performance is concerned. But the operation was actually characterized by two let's call them two major impacts during 20, 2018. 
it was a infrastructure disruption, our safety incident that Neil has alluded to, and obviously the strike had started on the 21st of, uh, of November, which was very, un very unfortunate. So if you look at the... Yeah. So if you look at the, perf uh, the performance for, for 2018, um, and I'm going to fo focus on the top right-hand uh, uh, graph. Uh, you can see the impacts that it's had on our different operations. If I start off with, uh, with Beatrix, in February of last year, we unfortunately had the power outage, the ESCOM power outage. It cost us just over a week of production, which impacted Beatrix. And, and obviously, the, the strike that I will talk a little bit more about, uh, it started on the 21st of November. The operation that was the that picked up the biggest of the impact was actually at Driefontein. At Driefontein, obviously, we had the seismic event. I'm sure you're all aware of the seismic event that took place. Unfortunately, it took out quite a bit of our infrastructure, uh, which impacted the first half of the year, but also impacted or flowed over into the second half of, uh, of the year, specifically at our Driefontein one shaft, where we had to do infrastructure rehabilitation. It took us up until October to, to finish off. And unfortunately, we then went into, a, into the strike period starting on the 21st. Kloof, that no, not that much impacted. Kloof also impacted by, by seismic events, uh, but also impacted by a safety incident that cost the, the lives of five of our employees, which also impacted on Kloof in the first half of the year. Not so much in the second half. Second half, as I said, mainly impacted the, uh, the Dufontaine operations. If you look at the bottom graph on the bottom right corner, uh, essentially, the all-in cost impacted by, by uh, the lower volumes that was uh, achieved over the, over the period. Now, normally, and, and now I want to just talk about the, the issue around, around the strike. Um, we normally, before we go into strike ne uh, wage negotiations, we obviously put some plans in place. I think it would be naive for us not to do that. So we do put plans in place before we start the negotiations. Those plans are well in place at the moment. Um, it doesn't fully offset the production we're able to do, doesn't fully offset the cost, and therefore there is impact on the business. However, the plans that we've put in place have come to fruition, and uh, those plans are ongoing uh, for as long as the strike carries on, and I hope for not too, too long in the distant future. What we also do on a, on a continuous basis, in fact, on a quarterly basis, we sit with all our stakeholders and we review our operations, specifically the marginal operations. And part of that review... It's, it's the so-called future forum meetings. Part of that review is to sit with stakeholders and to try and come up with alternatives in terms of how we want to restructure our business and make our business more profitable. In fact, as far as the affected operations are concerned, that forms the, the basis of the, the 189 that I'll talk a little bit about, uh, we actually, in fact, had a task team in place to look at alternatives to how we could uh, reduce the cost base of those operations. Unfortunately, it was interrupted by the strike, and therefore, those are the operations that therefore makes the basis of the, of the 189 process going forward. As Neil has said, it doesn't mean that all of the employees that we, that we indicated on the previous slide are going to lose their jobs. That is the, the process that we will go through in terms of the consultation process. And hopefully, we will come up with alternatives um, to try and minimize. Um, we're not going to stand here and say it will be zero, but we will try and minimize the job losses for, you know, uh, as far as we, uh, as we can. I actually want to use this schematic just to talk a little bit about those specific operations that are the, the, the subject of the 189. So this is a schematic that shows the, the Beatrix operations. So at Beatrix, we essentially have got four shafts, which is Beatrix 1, 2, 3, and four shafts. Four shaft is a standalone. It's not the subject of our 189 process. What is the subject of our 189 process is our, is our Beatrix 1 shaft. In fact, Beatrix 2 shaft we have already closed. The production we were able to get out of that shaft does not compensate for the input cost, and therefore that operation was closed. One shaft is in a similar situation at this stage. The production we were able to get out of that shaft does not justify the input cost, and therefore that's the subject of the 189 process. However, this shaft, unfortunately, we can't close the infrastructure on that shaft because it does act as a second escape for our long-life shaft, which is Beatrix 3 shaft. And as you can see on the right-hand side, it's also uh, a pumping shaft. So the water also gets pumped out of, out of Beatrix 1 shaft. So therefore, we'll, we'll stop the production, but the infrastructure 
will be uh, the subject of a care and maintenance uh, process going, going forward. The more complicated one, and the one that's probably our Achilles heel at the moment that we need to sort out in terms of the base cost or the base cost structure is Driefontein. I'm going to take the opportunity and just take you through this from left, from left to right. Uh, you can see it's very complicated, especially on that side. The shafts are very interdependent. So if I start on the left-hand side, Driefontein 10 shaft is a pumping shaft. It will be a pumping shaft for the life of the Driefontein operations. So is Driefontein 8 shaft. So those, these two shafts, unfortunately, we have to keep that infrastructure, infrastructure open for, for pumping purposes. 7 shaft, as you can see on the right-hand side, which is the subject of our 189 process, is not dependent or interdependent on any of the other shafts, and therefore we envisage closing this infrastructure unless we can come up with alternatives. Nine shaft is a shaft that was sunk to that level and never went into production. We're currently using it. As you can see, it is linked. We use it as a, as a ventilation shaft for the remaining of the, uh, for the other operations. Six shaft, which is the subject of the 189, you can see the amount of infrastructure we have on six shaft. It is a shaft that we envisage closing. In fact, six shaft, if you look at six tertiary shaft, a lot of that production we were able to do from, from uh, uh, Drifontaine one shaft. So uh, we, envisage, we envisage closing that, that part of the infrastructure. On the right hand side is where things become slightly complicated. Um, five shaft, two shaft, four shaft, very interdependent. In fact, they on this level here, 22 level, um, four shaft and five shaft, very dependent on two shafts. So though two shafts is the subject of the 189, we'll stop the mining. Again, the volume doesn't just... ...out of two shafts. It does get complicated in terms of our ability to switch off infrastructure cost, which is what is needed to, to rebase Driefontein and therefore drop the, hopefully drop that pay limit so we can mine more of the ore reserves that we've got available there. So that's where we are at the moment. That's the, the, uh, the process that we, that we will be going through over the next 60 to 90 days as part of the 189. And I say again, hopefully we come out of that with not too many jobs that are, that are impacted. Thank you very much. At this stage, I'd like to hand over to Charles. If there's any questions, we'll, we'll take those questions later. <coughs> Thank you, Shadwick, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as Neil says, um, obviously a complicated set of financial results, and uh, I think at our audit committee, the audit committee acknowledged um, you know, the difficulty in the accounting, call it below the adjusted EBITDA line. But in saying that, you know, we're comfortable that uh, we got it right. Our auditors are happy with what we've done below the line, so no problems as far as that is concerned. I think if we start with revenue, let me just get there, apologies. You'll see that revenue was flat um, for the comparative period, um, which in this case is half to 2017, at about 26.7 billion. The US operations increased by 10%, and the SAPGM operations increased by 15%. However, the South African gold operations decreased by 27%, down to about 8.9 billion rand. And as highlighted, you know, that was the, the main reason for that was the significant operational challenges that these operations had suffered, and then the strike which started in November. Just for, for reference, included in that revenue number is just over about a billion rand um, for um, DRD. Moving on to cost of sales, cost of sales increased by 2% if we exclude DRD. Um, the USPGM operations were affected by some higher maintenance costs and planned outages at the MET complex. The SAPGM operations largely affected by wages and electricity increases, the, the inflationary increase, or in this case above inflation increases. The South African operations um, compensated, uh, the gold operations compensated to some extent to that. They were 7% down, but that was mainly on the back of the low production. If we now look at net other cash costs um, of 400 million, included in that number is 291 million um, for the Cook care and maintenance, about 7 million rand for the Marikana care and maintenance, and then there's some other charges, some corporate and social investments of 37 million, and then some other royalties um, at our PGM operations amounting to about 63 million rand. 
Our adjusted EBITDA is just under four and a half billion for the period under consideration, compared to six billion um, in half to 2017. The adjusted EBITDA from the USPGM operations was about 2.3 billion rand, compared to 1.8 billion the same period um, in 2017. SAPGM just under 1.9 billion, compared to 1.1 billion in 2017. The South African gold operations, however, was negatively affected. Um, the adjusted EBITDA from the South African gold operations was only 300 million. Now this compares to about 3 billion for the same period in 2017. Obviously, Shadwick and Neil have spoken extensively to the reasons behind that. Um, but as Shadwick has said, the challenge for us now is to fix that and, and to, to get that EBITDA margin up to a more sustainable level. Uh, our consolidation of DRD, although it, it's small at this point in time, it's only a 36 million contribution to EBITDA, but nevertheless it is a contribution, and as the DRD projects start ramping up, we do believe that that will also be a significant contributor to our results. Net finance charges, that was um, at uh, about 1.5 billion rand. That was largely affected by the non-cash interest portion on the, on the streaming transaction. So if we exclude that, you can see that the finance charges basically stayed flat year on year. Another item that, that jumps out at the reader is the gain on financial instruments. Um, this was largely an adjustment to the, to the Burnstone cash flows and the Burnstone debt and the recoverability of that. And, uh, you know, that necessitated that we book again through the income statement. In simple terms, the revised cash flow shows that, um, you know, the, the liability won't be fully recovered. And, uh, you know, we just made that adjustment um, through the income statement of about 800 million rand. Um, that was offset by, or not offset, but that was um, also complemented by the share base payment that is on the Rustenburg BE transaction, and then the deferred payment to to uh, to, Rusten, to Anglo Platinum. Apologies, those two numbers was about 400 million rand. The other big one is the gain on foreign exchange. The main reason for that was mainly due to the foreign exchange gain on our net uh, on our uh, financial assets. The exchange rate moved from from about 12 rand 30 as at the end of December 2017 to about 14 rand 30 and that revaluation um, is the result for the gain on exchange differences. Obviously Shadwick has uh, shown us the schematics and the impacts of the, the uh, section 189 at Beatrix and at Trifontaine. The impact of that is that we booked an impairment for those shafts. So the impairment for Drifontaine and Beatrix is 2.8 billion rand, and, then, and as, as I said, there's also an impact on the cash flows at Burnstone because of the delay in the project, and we impaired that carrying value by a further 200 million rand. Another area of contention is, is the mining and income tax. You will remember that a year ago we stood here and we said thank you to Mr. Trump signing the tax laws. Um, we could book a two and a half billion gain on deferred tax. However, tax in the U.S. is complicated, and each state has its own nuances. So you can potentially have in excess of 50 different sets of a county uh, tax legislation. Um, what has happened is there were some tax changes signed into law by the governor of New Jersey. This is where the Stillwater Trading Company is housed. And the effect of that, the most significant change, is that um, the tax is calculated on all U.S. entities under common control. So that is in excess of 50%. So what that has meant is that um, you know, our tax rate has gone up um, based on that change signed into law by the, the New Jersey governor, and we had to book a deferred tax um, charged through the income statement of about 1.5 billion rand. Um, it's still early days. We are looking at our options um, concerning New Jersey, um, and hopefully at the next set of results we can give you some positive feedback as um, you know, we will look at options to, to um, the New Jersey tax changes. The result of that, as Neil has said, is a, 
a loss of two and a half billion, um, and that compares to a profit for the same period in 2017 of 370 million. Again, largely impacted by the reduction in EBITDA, but also the impairments that we took at the South African gold operations. We thought that uh, we would just give an update on the streaming transaction. You know, we get quite a few questions um, asking how this is accounted for. So to date, um, as at half two 2018, we've um, delivered 8,700 palladium ounces and 5,500 gold ounces. The revenue recognized for that is 201 million rand. It consists of a cash portion. Remember the streaming transaction, we get 18% physically paid to us in cash. And then because this is a deferred revenue, we are also accounting for the advance payment, and that is amortized over the life of the stream through the income statement. So we are also recognizing a non-cash revenue of about 160 million rand for the half 2018. Uh, we also had to, to buy the metal credits, so um, the contract requires that the palladium and the gold, um, we, we physically transfer the metal credits to wheat and precious metals, and that accounted for 228 million through the income statement. So you can see the net effect for this half on EBITDA was a reduction in 27 million. Um, obviously accounting requires us to, to book a non-cash finance expense, and that was 160 million for the half to 2018 which meant that the streaming transaction had about 180 million effect on our net earnings. Debt management, Neil has spoken about that, but we've successfully refinanced our $350 million facility. We've upsized that to $600 million um, with a smaller group of banks just to make it more manageable and to make the ticket size as relevant. And, and that was done in April 2018, and that provided significant liquidity for the group. We also completed the streaming transaction in July 2018, um, and that, is, uh, that has also brought in additional liquidity, which we then utilized to permanently reduce some of our bonds. We've, we applied 395 million of the 500 million um, to buy back some of our um, publicly traded bond, bonds and the convert. And the effect of that is that pre, pre the buyback, the annual interest charges was about $78 million on, on these three bonds. And by buying back $395 million of those bonds, we have reduced that annual interest charge by $25 million. That's a 32% saving just on the cash interest portion. Uh, more interestingly, the cash interest Paid, that would have been paid over the life of this instrument would have been about $480 million, and that has come down by $137 million over the life of, of these instruments. So you can see that the streaming transaction was a very good um, financing transaction, but we also responsibly applied that, one, to buy back our debt, but also to reduce our cash interest charge on a go-forward basis. The debt position... As you can see that our net debt has reduced, as I've explained, the application of the streaming um, proceeds. It reduced from about 25.2 billion rand to 30, uh, to, sorry, it reduced to 21.3 billion from about 25.2 billion. Again, the, the streaming income was used to buy back the bonds and we applied $395 million to buy back about 415 million rands worth of bonds, which, is, which equates roughly to about 95% of our bonds at par. But, but you can clearly see how the debt position has evolved over time. And um, you know, once we get through the strike period, we will also make further significant inroads into, into the debt um, based on the EBITDA um, gearing that you've seen from, from both the gold and the, SA, and the PGM assets in, in our portfolio. Just on leverage, you can see um, the evolution of our leverage. Uh, leverage as at the end of the year was 2.5, which compares to about 2.6 at the end of 2017. Um, and we were well on track for the deleveraging. 
but obviously the EBITDA losses that we've suffered at our SA Gold operations um, has had an impact on, on the net debt to adjusted EBITDA. Um, this together with the contract change that um, I'll discuss uh, in a few slides at Rustenburg um, required us to approach our lenders and to, to just get sufficient headroom to, to cope with the contract change and the build-up at the gold operations, and, and that was granted at three and a half times net debt to adjusted EBITDA for a further 12-month period. However, the ongoing strikes in conjunction with the Rustenburg contract change has now required that we approach the lenders to get a, a covenant waiver for quarter one, um, and as Neil says, you know, so that we, that we can take the right decisions around the industrial action that we are suffering at our operations. If you look at our debt maturity profile, um, I think this is a low-risk debt maturity profile. Um, our first major commitments coincide with the steady-state production at Blitz in 2021. And, uh, you know, just to illustrate the, the gearing at the, at the Blitz, of, or at the Stillwater operations, at today's spot basket price, you know, using what we've put in the market as guidance, um, Stillwater pre-tax and interest can generate in excess of $250 million just for 2019. Fast forward to Blitz, fully ramped up, that number more than doubles. So you can see how, how our debt maturity profile and the ramp up at Blitz is complementary. I'd like to just take some time and, and talk to you this morning about uh, the Moody's downgrade. Um, you know, I was very disappointed at what we saw um, in terms of the Moody's methodology. Um, their approach to liquidity is um, that we will not have market access for 12 to 18 months during the time of our RAND refinancing. Now, clearly, that's not our base case. You know, to date, we've successfully refinanced our RAND facility on more than one occasion. Um, we've upsized it from the facilities that we inherited from Goldfields. So, in my, in my view, you know, the Moody's methodology being what it is, is fatally flawed. You know, I, I do believe that within the next eight or nine months, um, before November 2019, we would have successfully refinanced that. But, a, but that is their methodology, and as I said, you know, we, we, we spoke to them, and uh, you know, they have a firm view on that. Um, and then the other, the other area that they do cite is the challenging operating environment um, that Sabanya is facing in South Africa. But again, I would argue that that operating environment hasn't changed for us. Um, from last year to this year. It is still South Africa, it's still got its unique challenges, and we have to navigate that. But be that as it may, those were the two main considerations for Moody's. Um, we will be engaging with them post the strike um, coming to, to an end, and the, the RAND refinancing, um, and then we'll um, discuss um, the, the approach that they have taken. But just to come back to our, to our debt profile, you can see that it is well structured. Um, as I said, um, the first major um, significant repayment will be the 2022 bonds. You remember that um, when we refinanced our dollar facility, and that is that block in red of about $190 million, we built in that we have two optional one-year extensions, and we intend on exercising that. I'd just like to discuss the impact of the Rustenburg purchase of concentrate um, that changes to a toll arrangement. You will remember as part of the acquisition of the Rustenburg operations, we specifically, part of the, of the um, acquisition, we requested that we would like to get access to physical metal, um, and we are at that point now. So in short, what it means is that we're previously a percentage so the concentrate was delivered to Angler, and they retained a percentage of the metal, and that covered their, their refining costs, and obviously some margin that they made on that. The effect of that, and if, if I can use the slide, is that it did mean that we had lower operating costs, um, because the refining was already covered as a percentage of the metal. But what it did mean is that we didn't have full exposure um, to changes in commodity prices, um, on all of our metals. As part of the toll arrangement, the 
Anglo-Platinum will effectively take our concentrate, um, they will refine it, and they will deliver the metal to us. What it does mean is that we will be paying a slightly elevated charge for the actual toll refining. That is about 1,500 to 1,600 rand per 4 e ounce. Um, but what it does mean, and you can see, so the effect is that we do see from there higher operating costs, as I said, by the tune of about 1,500 rand per 4 e ounce. But it also means that we now have the full exposure on our metals. Obviously, the change in contract, um, there is a break-even point. That break-even point where this is advantageous to us is roughly between 15,200 per 4 e ounce and 15,500 per 4 e ounce. Sorry, this thing is playing with me this morning. Um, so that is the point where, where it's the, whether, whether you are on a purchase of concentrate or whether you're on a toll arrangement, the net effect would be the same. Uh, would be the same. But beyond that point, you can see how this margin significantly opens up versus the purchase of concentrate. And that is the main reason, um, other than you know, the strategic benefits of, of having metals and being able to market that, but on the peer economics, that is the reason why we specifically pushed for this as part of the agreement. The purchase of concentrate to the toll treatment also has um, some accounting considerations. Nothing is quite simple anymore. The accountants always have to get involved. So whereas previously, under the delivery of the, under the purchase of concentrate, when we delivered the concentrate, the sale was recognized, as this was the point where risk and rewards transferred to Anglo-Platinum. However, under the toll arrangement, um, risk and reward only transfers when we get physical metal that we can sell. Now, that is a delay of about three to four months on our primary metals, depending on which metals it is. So the effect of that is, is that we can only recognize revenue delivered on 1 January, roughly about um, the 1st of April, between the 1st of April and the 1st of May. Um, now, for, the, for quarter one, as Neela said, you know, that's why we are highlighting it. We will realize no revenue from our Rustenburg operations and consequently no costs either. That costs will be dropped out. Um, the impact of that uh, is that we then do lose the EBITDA margin for that quarter one. Um, so the revenue is dropped out, the cost is dropped out, but you're also losing the margin. If you take half two as, an, as, a, as a proxy, that's about 900 million rand of EBITDA margin that we will be losing for quarter one. I'd like to stress that this is not a cash flow impact. When we acquired the Rustenburg operations, we acquired it with a three-month pipeline. So that pipeline, the, the cash, as when, when the material was delivered, that pipeline will now come through you know, as, as we move from a, a purchase of concentrate to a toll arrangement. So it is quite complicated, um, but it's just safe to say that the point of revenue recognition has shifted, um, which means that we won't be able to, to recognize that in quarter one. But um, the significant impact for us is the reduction in, in the EBITDA that we lose because of this contract change. And that is why we did approach our lenders um, over and above the strike action um, to give us the, the necessary headroom which they've, uh, which they've agreed to. And as Neela said, you know, and we value that support from our bankers. Obviously, there's, I'm sure there'll be questions. So I'll be available afterwards for anybody that'd like to understand this better. Um, but at this point in time, you know, I'd like to hand back to Neil to take us through the strategic development. <clears throat> Thanks, Sean. Well done. Yeah, as you can see, a complex set of uh, set of numbers, and and for me, much easier to look forward than look back at the moment. Um, so let's talk about uh, a little bit of looking back, but at a high level. Um, I'm very, very pleased and, and actually very proud of uh, my team um, for having done what they've done. Um, we have built what, uh, what I'm going to show you, the biggest platinum producer in the world, for a total cost that is under 40 billion rand. Um, that's uh, that's a, small, a small portion of what other companies have spent in building their companies. Um, and, and the reason we were able to do it is we called the market exactly right. And um, we've said that at uh, previous presentations. Um, you can see how the numbers have stacked up, and uh, I will try and do it in a, in a 
in a clearer way just now. That was the, the timing of our entry. Um, you can see all the different uh, um, commodity prices there, both in Rand and dollar terms, um, Aquarius and Rustenburg. And I was in two minds whether to put the, the impact of the change from POC to TOL in the financial section or in the strategic se section, because it's another aspect of the way we structured the Rustenburg transaction that was based on our view of where we would be when this contract uh, changed from a POC to TOL. But I think um, the, the, the financial considerations are quite complex, so, so we put it in the financial section. But well-timed entries, palladium and rhodium prices have risen by, risen by over 150 and 300 percent respectively since we announced the Aquarius and Rustenburg uh, transactions. And, uh, and the fundamentals of the market are still really solid. And I've got no market slides uh, in here because I think what we said a year ago and maybe even 18 months, two years ago, I have played out uh, today. Um, just about exactly as we saw it. Um, substitution will be necessary. That's a fact of life. And platinum, palladium will be substituted by platinum um, in the not too distant future. Um, our view has always been that the demand for PGMs, the fundamentals are really good um, in the medium term, despite um, electric vehicles or battery powered electric vehicles despite anti-diesel sentiment, despite all those things. And our view was always based on changes in supply more, are going to impact more than demand. Um, in terms of how it's impacted us, again, just an update on what we presented before. Looking at 2018, um, um, almost 50% of our revenue now comes offshore. Um, if you look at it by metal, and I'm the first to acknowledge our gold division's underperforming, but 84% is coming out of PGMs. Um, even if our gold division performs, moving into a stronger commodity price environment in the PGMs, I don't think that 16% is going to go much higher than 20, maybe 22%. Let's see. We will get our gold division back on track, but we're still going to have a large majority of revenue from PGMs. What we've done, and this obviously includes our a post Lonman uh, closure, we've, we've actually ranked primary production, not what's treated, because these numbers get, we could, we could include the treatment of our recycled material, um, and that distorts these numbers, but we've taken primary production. And um, in terms of platinum, as I've said, post Lonman will be the biggest platinum producer in the world. Um, in terms of palladium, we'll be the second biggest palladium producer in the world. Very important to note that, uh, that rhodium is almost the unsung hero of uh, the changes in, in, in PGM markets. Um, the graph you see there is a Marensky UG2 um, graph. It shows you a crossover in terms of the basket price in 2017, around about August, where um, UG2 uh, or, or Reef actually, from a basket price point of view, outperformed Marensky. And, and there is a view still in the market that a quality platinum pro a PGM producer has to produce Marensky. It might change in the future as the platinum price changes, but I would argue that there are significant benefits of mining UG2. And just move to the bottom of that table, you can see it. Um, the, 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 the exposure to rhodium is significantly high, especially in our case, 10.5% at Rustenburg, 9.9% at Krindal, and of course the chrome credits are very, very significant. Make a big, big difference uh, um, to, to the business. So, so very, very useful to have a large UG2 exposure. So completing the basket in terms of rhodium, we, we are very close to Impala in terms of uh, the number of ounces of pr primary production. 
we're not writing off gold. There is this perception we constantly get that uh, we're moving from a, a gold company to a PGM company. I, I think our rating at the moment should really be PGM based, but that's up to the market. But in terms of equivalent ounces, a very significant uh, um, equivalent ounce production profile. Whether that's uh, of any use to anyone, I don't know, but uh, those are the facts. Just moving on to our portfolio of mineral reserves and resources. Um, I'm not going to quote each number here. Large resource and reserve base in platinum. A good portion of that is, uh, is uh, um, Lonman once it's closed. On, in terms of gold, still a very large resource base. A lot's going to happen, uh, dep be dependent on, uh, on uh, the investment-friendly nature of, of South Africa, whether that's ever brought to account. It's going to depend on technology advances and so on. But importantly, I think, just look at the reserve. 16.6 .6 million ounces. When we started as a gold company in 2013, we had 12 million ounces. Okay, we've been mining for five years. Um, we've now got 16.6, and we've produced 500,000 ounces more than the original gold fields plan. So, um, in my mind, a, a very solid delivery of value. Um, and, and this is just in a shown in a different way. So, what we started with in 2013 was the profile on the left. Where we are today, we have a, a a, a gold company which is shown in the gold that still has 15 years of life based on our current reserves and remember we've put them through a very a very strict uh, strategic filter but have a look at the combination of uh, of the PGM business to our production profile we really have developed a very sustainable business um, let's talk about it in a different way uh, in terms of value so so again, we've just completed our life of mine. We've, uh, we've just declared reserves. Um, they underpin a life of mine analysis. We've, we've run a, a net present value model um, based on those discount factors in the US, South Africa, our gold business. And as I say, our gold business still has value. Um, we've assumed Lonman is part of this. Um, you can discount that out if you want. And we've taken off the group debt. And you will see that we have roughly 100 billion rand of net present value. At our current number of issued shares, that translates to a, a 44 rand uh, share price. That would be a price to NPV of one. Um, we currently trade at about 0.3 to 0.4 times um, in terms of our market cap uh, at 15 rand 80 a share. And then we, we did an exercise. If we, if we took, if we had not done anything, just carried on with that gold business and we used the, and we had not incurred any dilution to shareholders, the equivalent rating on a per share basis would have been seven rand today. So despite the issue of shares, despite the creation of, uh, of debt, I think that's a very significant uh, uplift in value, which we have to get into the share price, and we actually know exactly why it's not going into the share price, and that's where our focus will be, and I'll get to that. Our guidance for 2019 is shown in the, in the table. We are not giving any guidance for our gold business. It's, uh, it's roughly 15% of our business. It is, it is material, but we can't give you guidance today until we know exactly when the strike's going to end. And in fact, uh, we're not going to do it until the 189 process is finished either. Um, but there are the guidance for the PGM business, both in South Africa and the US. And it's, uh, it's really steady state in South Africa. It's continued build up at, uh, in the US in terms of blitz um, and the appropriate costs that are incorporated in the board approved budgets. Let's just talk a little bit, so where to from now? I think we, we've got a business that uh, is, is going to be managed, going to be focused on, there's going to be organic growth in it, there's going to be optimization, that's, uh, that's all good and well. But where, where is our next wave of growth coming from? So I'm sure you're all familiar with sigmoid curves, and from a, a strategic point of view, they're very useful. So that's where we started, a gold business um, that's got... Uh, you know, 10 to 15 years, life of mine, 
we like gold. Um, but I want to say that it's the wrong time to go and do M&A in gold, especially when it's become a fashion and there's going to be non-core assets. They're going to be in competitive processes. I'm not sure how you create value when you, when you do that um, in that environment. We then moved into PGMs. I remember announcing it and everyone telling us we're crazy and, uh, and that's where you get the dip. Um, still very South African focused. And then, of course, the next sigmoid loop was our step into Stillwater. Um, and, and by the way, I, I'm not sure if you looked at the NPV of Stillwater uh, on the NPV graph, but it's doubled in value, absolutely doubled. And those are big numbers. But there, there's the uplift in value. And then, of course, so what now? And, um, and we believe that through our very good understanding we've got of the, C, uh, the PGM markets, uh, we've got to understand what the new age metals are probably going to look like. Um, and we want to position ourselves for the new world. And, and things are changing rapidly. We want to be a mining company that's going to be a new world mining company. Um, and we think that the new world is really going to be in the high-tech minerals or metals. Um, we clearly don't have all the insights, and therefore we've acquired SFA Oxford. And, uh, and, and certainly they're well known for their work in PGMs, but uh, what they may not be as well known for is their, their knowledge in, in powertrains and, uh, and other areas of the associated business. Um, so you can, you can see um, it's a leading commodity consultancy with expertise in future technologies and mobility. Um, when you talk electric powertrains, again, I just want to emphasize that, that everybody associates it with batteries. It's not always associated with batteries. It's, you need to associate it with fuel cells and, uh, and hybrids. Um, but nevertheless, they've developed really good knowledge uh, in terms of some of these future technologies. We could, of course, try and put a team together. We, we have looked at the cost of that. Um, it's probably a similar cost to what we've paid, but it would probably take us two years uh, to, to get that done. We're not a management team that sits on its hands. So we've, we, we've made this investment, and, uh, um, and some of the rationale is as follows. It's, uh, it's an opportunity to fast track and build internal competency and knowledge re relating to drivetrain technology, the related metals and battery metal technology, um, direct access to a high quality research team, everyone knows Steve Forrest, immediate and ongoing access to quality research uh, from a team that's uh, established market links uh, through the metals value chain. And uh, as Charles said, the, the change to a toll agreement to get access to our metals was fundamental in being involved in, uh, in, in, the, in, in some of the downstream and supply chain uh, aspects of this market. Um, SFA will continue to operate as an independent unit. We know that perhaps some of the organizations that use them may not use them anymore because... Uh, um, we will be involved, but we've factored that into our thinking. And, uh, and factoring that in, we, we believe we have a model that is uh, cost neutral. Um, we are going to maintain the independence. You would have seen from the announcement that Jim Sutcliffe will sit on that SFA board. And, um, and of course, uh, um, Steve will remain as the CEO and uh, chairman going forward. Having said that, that doesn't mean we're rushing out, and, and certainly our lenders, we're not rushing out to buy other commodities uh, or opportunities. This is an 18-month, two-year process of developing the right knowledge to identify the right targets, and we will, as we did with PGMs, we'll keep you appraised. Um, um, our immediate priorities are really about getting our business uh, firing on all cylinders, um, the values-based uh, decision-making and the cultural change that we are driving through our organization is, is primary uh, to our success. Um, we've got a number of initiatives uh, um, set out um, that are going to do that. Davi is focused on that as the executive responsible for that. 
the focus on safe production is, is key. Now, clearly, the, the values-based decision-making is, we believe, going to have a big impact on safety as well. So hopefully we will uh, impact positively on safe production and, uh, and, and continue to drive our costs uh, um, to the lower quartile in, in all areas uh, of our business. Gold will be challenging to achieve that, but we will get our cost structures down by having the right size business uh, with the right fixed cost structure for the volume produced. So unit costs should be a lot better. By delivering on those things, our EBITDA will be restored, which will go a long, long way to doing th two things. The one is obviously generating cash and uh, reducing our net debt. The other, the other, the other issue is increasing uh, the EBITDA, which uh, from a net debt to EBITDA is going to have uh, a positive effect as well. Once we've got all that done, we will consider where we are as uh, as a country, a company, whether um, the, the, the country issues continue to undermine our valuations and, um, and then once we've got a share price that um, is, is representative of the value in the company, we will consider value accretive uh, organisations. I must also say that we will not do that until we've got our leverage down. So that's, that's our focus now. The SFA Oxford acquisition important to announce we're signaling um, a, a, an additional focus area to our business but we are not rushing off to buy um, new assets um, so that uh, that really brings us to the end of the question the, the presentation we are obviously happy to take questions but I'm going to ask my colleagues uh, to do most of the legwork so let me let me go first with Renee Sorry, who's first? Sorry, I didn't see that. Adrian, go, go, it's fine, you got the mic. Good morning, Neil, Adrian Hammond, uh, Standard Bank. Um, just three questions from my side, please. Uh, firstly, uh, just to follow on with SF, SFA, Oxford, um, does, it, does this mean it's fair to say that you'd be interested in uh, metals like lithium, cobalt, nickel in the future? Yeah, listen, those, those are the obvious metals, but we think technology will move so fast, it's not obvious that they will be part of the future suite, but it's those type of metals that, uh, that could be of interest to us, yes. And just on dividends and policy, um, given where SPOT is today, would you consider paying dividends again? And if so, what would that policy be? We, we, we have a dividend policy. We would like to pay dividends as soon as we can. And, and again, I think uh, um, in recognition of our lenders, um, at the right time in terms of uh, leverage, but our dividend policy is 35% of normalised earnings, and of course the the audit committee and the board make an assessment of uh, solvency, liquidity, and so on. Um, we are very very keen for the value we've created to flow back to our shareholders, a in terms of a re-rating of our share price, and of course in returning some cash back to them. And lastly, just given these uh, current spot prices and, and looking at plans around Lonman, have you reconsidered um, the uh, amount of retrenchments there on, in, in regards to extending current shafts that were destined for closure? Yeah, look, in terms of our competition submission, the, the, base, the, the, the basis of the 12,600 were um, the commodity price or the basket price at the time, which was around 13,000, maybe even a bit lower. We committed to certain projects um, at certain basket prices and certain, um, let's say, market receptiveness in terms of not oversupplying the market at, at certain basket prices, and, and, and we committed to that. And yes, that will have an impact. Um, so the, the, the situation has changed, um, but our, our commitment to, to that, I can't tell you exactly what it's, what it's going to be. We need approval of the, the transaction, and we'll adhere to those, uh, those commitments. Thank you. Hi, Neil. Um, there you go. Sorry. Sorry. I was um, looking at the, the mic there. <laughs> go for it. Uh, like I said earlier on, well done for almost breaking even. Um, Thank you. So you had a bad year last year, but well done. 
Um, with the th with the two e basket price now at thirteen fifty dollars per ounce, um, and uh, Charles gave us two fifty million dollars and five hundred million dollars in nineteen and twenty um, possible cash to allay that one point four billion net debt that you have. Um, could you give us an estimate for 21, 2021 and twenty twenty two, what you could make at the current basket price? Sure, <laughs> help me. <laughs> That, that is 2021. That's when Blitz is at steady state. No, 250 is, is guidance, guidance at spot prices. The doubling is Blitz fully ramped up by 2021. So that yeah, is 2021. So, and so it's be a gradual build up based on spot price to those sort of. Yeah. 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 And then you will have steady state from, from the, the US operation. Okay. Please. Hi, Neil. Um, my name is Myron. I'm with Metal Industries Pension Fund. Right? We're a long-only fund, and we're a long-patient investor. Right? And we've been long-term shareholders in Sibanye, right? Having said that, right, do you understand the concept of circle of competence? Uh, if Neil Froneman comes and tells me, I understand gold, and I'm going to do acquisitions in gold, I'll say, yes, Neil, you're the man. You know what you're doing. If you tell me, I understand PGM, mm. because I live in South Africa, I'm a minor, I know what you're doing. I'll say, yes, Neil, you know what you're doing. But if you come and tell me, I understand new tech minerals, I'm going to have some choice words for you. Mm. Right? So please think carefully about that. Yeah. yeah? So, so can, I, can I say, if you were here two years ago or three years ago, um, you would have said exactly the same thing when we entered, uh, when we signaled we were considering an entry into the PGMs. We didn't have any knowledge uh, about PGMs, we, but we made it our business to go and secure that knowledge. An entry into, into new age metals requires us to go and get that knowledge. And if we get that knowledge and it says that's not the place to go, we're not going to go there. So, so no, we're not claiming we have the knowledge, but we will build up that competence before we make that decision. Thank you. Um, hi, Neil. Leon, yes, Nedbank. Uh, just two quick questions. Can you give us any indication of your actual cash burn at your gold assets currently? Uh, we only had what, one and a half months at the end of last year. Yeah. So I can make a calculation, but it uh, doesn't look too great. The um, second question is, on your PGM assets, and given this, the, the threats by AMCU, um, you're going to be clearing your pipeline over the next quarter. Mm. You're going to be draining that down to zero. Um, so then you're very vulnerable. Um, so how do you cover that risk? Thanks. Yeah, just on that, on the pipeline, we're draining that, uh, the POC pipeline, but we're building up another pipeline uh, in front of it in terms of toll. So one pipeline replaces another over a period of time. Um, but but in, terms of, uh, in terms of a strike... Um, um, and again, I think Shadwick said it, you know, when we, we don't start preparing strike plans when we start negotiations. I can tell you those strike plans are already prepared, and especially since there were suggestions of a se secondary strike. But uh, it's, more, it's more about having um, plans on keeping um, mechanized, mechanized sections going. It's about creating stockpiles. Um, you're welcome to visit our operations. We can show you the size of the stockpiles we have. Um, I can tell you a seven-day strike is going to have practically no impact uh, if, uh, if uh, AMCU is able to, to muster that s sort of support. Um, you know, the, the, and, and again, let's just talk a little bit about that. So they hire a, a stadium. Um, this is now post uh, probably the last time I briefed you uh, in Cape Town. But they, they hired the Impala Stadium. Um, for the Impala workers, they had 4,000 people turn up. Now, that sounds like a lot of people, but Impala has 40,000 employees. I would, get, I would suggest probably half of those employees were probably our employees and maybe Lonman employees. So there's very, there, it, it's not representative, and that's my problem with these getting strike ballots in mass meetings. Um, it's not representative of the other 90% of Impala, as an example. We don't think, we don't see a lot of support um, four secondary strikes, uh, and outside of our business, we don't think they're legal anyway. So, 
that remains to be seen. But we well, we well positioned for that, the, uh, for secondary strikes. I think in terms of wage negotiations in the platinum sector, we're busy preparing for that as well. And the cash burn? Cash burn, you know, 15 to 20 million a day. It's, it's, it's significant. Thanks. Hi, Neil. Uh, it's Chris Nicholson at RB Morgan Stanley. Um, my question is, is, is what's going on with the costs here? So it, it looks, if I look at your guidance, that they've slipped across the board, specifically in the PGM operations. Mm. Um, so, it, I mean, just if I have to run the numbers and tell me if I'm way off here, South African Platinum, I understand you've got the toll uh, treatment coming in, 1,500 per 40 ounce. Strip that out, it still looks like costs there are up 6 to 12% year on year. Uh, still water. Cost guidance looks up somewhere between two to eight percent in dollar terms. Mm. Now that's with that additional block of blitz coming on. I, I was to believe that you know as production ramped up, cost should come down at still water. Can mm. we still believe the five fifty long term? Mm. Thanks. So, <laughs> you guys better defend your cost numbers. So, <laughs> <laughs> so th there's a few things that are driving the cost. First thing, if you look at the current spot price against the uh, last year's realised price, there's $350 there, it's about a 5 to 6% direct relationship to, to cost, uh, to, to, to price, because we've got a royalty agreement with Franco Nevada, and there's some element of uh, Montana severance taxes that go into our all-in sustaining cost. 60% of our costs are labor at the mines, and we're running about a 2 2 2.5% labor inflation rate on there. So if you take those two numbers alone, that's a big part of that increase. But what I'd say about blitz ramp up, you don't bring a miner on board, we're doubling the production out of the Stillwater side essentially. We're bringing new people on board, you've got to bring these people on board early, train them up, get them ready. So you will see a bulge from a labour perspective and that's what you'll have seen in the second half of last year where we saw the all in sustaining costs move up. And then the final thing I'd say is that We've always had spare capacity at some of our fixed plant, and I would say that that hasn't made us run those fixed plants to the best of the, their ability. So we've got some major maintenance programs, second half in the smelter particularly, the met metallurgical contract com complex, and that will go again into 2019 as we ready those infrastructures for much higher throughputs as a result of the, of the blitz ramp up. So we do expect our costs to be coming down once we get to the steady state con uh, uh, production and once some of these maintenance programs, etc., start to deliver the benefits that, uh, that we forecasted. Does that but, you, but you will take the message back that there's an unhappiness about the costs. Yes. Thank you. So, sorry, Neil, and, and on the SA office, I'll yes. ask both of them. Yeah. Okay. And, and listen, the, the, the toll treatment is not yet in the numbers, so, yeah, so you've got a lot more to answer. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's in the forecast, just to be clear, but it's not in the... Okay. <laughs> okay. The difference in costs is about 2,000 Rand um, per 40 ounce. 75% of that is in the toll treatment cost. Um, remember now we're getting the full toll treatment cost, but what you're not seeing is the positive and the revenue. So I can assure you the benefit of the additional revenue uh, more than offsets the additional cost. So about 75% of, of that is in the toll treatment and the rest is in the other 25% uh, other is split 50-50, um, increased capex. Our capex is going up from 1 billion rand a year to 1.4 billion rand. Um, so there's a portion of it there. And our working costs have actually been maintained slightly below inflation. So, so really it's all in the in the um, toll treatment costs and in the increase on in capex year on year. So you, you're talking about guidance numbers? Okay, okay, so yes, it's in there. <coughs> Neil, it's Arnold from Netbank. Uh, just a quick question on, on the toll treatment and the marketing sorry, of the metal that. going forward. Have you assembled a marketing team to actually sell the metal or will it be run through still water and is there any overhead cost associated with assembling a team like that? Yeah. Rich, why don't you answer that? There's our team. <laughs> no, there's more to it than that. <laughs> it's the front row. <laughs> yeah, no, look, 
we have vinyl. Um, listen, it's actually it's quite a small team. Um, in fact, some of them are present today, so happy to come by afterwards and we can introduce you to them. Uh, what, what we're actually looking at is, I think there are two components when you look at it. There's a sales component and there's a marketing component to it. In fact, the sales component where you're really talking the logistics, a lot of the back office work, uh, at the moment we are effectively, we will be relying on the London existing infrastructure to do a lot of the, uh, let's call it back office manual kind of sales stuff. And almost the strategic side of it, i.e. How, how we do our marketing, the customers, uh, the contracts we're setting up, getting deeper into the supply chain. We've set up a team, it's effectively two people. Um, that we'll be looking at that, so it's a small team. So, so essentially the additional cost to us in, in this regard is minimal. Uh, so, so there are some senior strategic resources that have been introduced, uh, but largely the, the, let's call it back office mechanical, more sales side of it as opposed to marketing, uh, we will be benefiting straight from the existing London infrastructure to do that. Okay, who's got the mic? Yeah, go, go your teeth. Macquarie, um, just a quick one on, you know, you've had a, you've had a tough year in 2018, um, facing a potentially another tough year in 2019, more on, on the social side. Um, just firstly, on, 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 on your cost, uh, as, as uh, Chris has said, um, you know, you are expecting this, this to pick up. Where do you factor in ESCOM if they were to get the 15% increase? What does it imply for your planning in gold and in, in SAP GMs? Um, just sort of elaborate on that there, and furthermore, assuming that you know there is going to be a strike, what does it imply for your SA operations? Yeah, so so let me work back. Uh, we we don't plan for strikes um, in in terms of adjusting our numbers. So you you have to accept that uh, um, because that that strategically is not smart in terms of what your um, negotiations with the unions are going to lead to, um, you, you've got to be pretty firm. Um, so we don't plan for strikes. So if there is a strike, we have to come back to you and, uh, and adjust our guidance, which I think is fair. Um, obviously, we try and avoid a strike, but we, you know, and I can use the gold uh, um, strike as an example. We, um, you know, we, we, we know what the demand is. Uh, you know, other than it undermines other unions, that demand over so many people over so many years of uh, the life of those assets has a value, you know, and it's many billions of rands. Um, when we stop a, when we take a strike, as I said, the, the 15 to 20 million rand a day um, has a value. It adds up, and, and, and of course, if you terminate a strike before you've paid what you would have paid through an NPV over the life of mine, you, you've done better, you know. So, so. So you can only take that view if you're here for the long term, and that's the problem with our, that I have with some of the industry, is they know they're here for one or two years, and therefore they, they will allow uh, unrealistic increases, and it's long-life players like ourselves that are left standing trying to deal with what is, uh, what is fair. Um, coming to ESCOM, um, you know, we, we were one of the companies that made representation at two nurse, uh, in addition to the Minerals Council, um, and uh, and certainly we've highlighted that if if a 15% increase goes through, there'll be 8,000 job losses. We you just we just can't stomach that, and uh, you know, and therefore an increase of 15% is not in the national interest, and 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 more reason why Eskom needs to be restructured, recapitalised. Um, I think in a you know in a in a much more rigorous way than than what's being spoken. Shaul, what did we include in our budgets for Eskom? Was it ten percent? Yeah. So so we got ten percent in in our budgets, which are still well above inflation. And and uh, you know we we wouldn't be happy, but we'd accept an inflationary increase because that's what we try and do with all our costs, and then work them out of the system. Thanks. Uh, Hi, Neil. Um, Hi. Gadego from Investec. Um, you've spoken about 15 million to 20 million cash burn uh, per day. Uh, and like Chris uh, alluded to the costs, uh, you're guiding on higher costs on uh, uh, South Africa PGMs and even the US PGMs. When I look at your balance sheet, net debt EBITDA of 2.5 times. So I would think you actually can't quite afford 
uh, the strike, the ongoing strike on the gold division, uh, and even the threats of secondary strike on the platinum division. So what do you think will eventually break this deadlock with AMCO? Because at this point in time, it looks like it's just continuing, um, and it's, it's just continuing to, um, you know, there's no end in sight mm. right mm. now from where I'm standing. Yeah. L listen, we, we can afford the strike for a much longer period. Let me just make that clear. Um, because there's many other lever levers we can pull. Um, so, so, but that's not, that's not the smart thing to do. I think, um, I think the, it's clear that, that um, the union is resorting to very desperate measures in terms of trying to take out the industry on strike, which I don't believe legally they can do. But uh, um, clearly a compromise is, is required, and we have put compromises forward, but as long as it doesn't undermine the other unions. I think, I think personally that uh, um, the strike will not go on much longer. Um, I think we know, we, we, we know the support it's got, we know the desperation of the union, and we are particularly concerned about the well-being of our employees, and we know that they desperately want the strike to end. Um, so, so that's our view. Um, if we have an inflexible union on the other side, it's not just the cost in the gold sector, it's actually the cost of a platinum wage negotiation, and it's the cost of not being able to uh, integrate Lonman in the way it needs to be integrated. So th there's much bigger ramifications in the gold sector. Hi, good morning. Patrick, it's yeah, Patrick hi. Mann from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Um, maybe just to follow on from Chris's question um, to uh, Chris Bateman. Um, like Chris Nicholson said, the, the cost profile does seem to be running ahead of kind of the original plan for the ramp up of Blitz. I just want to, just to check that the 850,000 ounces at 550 to $600 ounce all in sustaining cost, is that still the long-term target for when Blitz is ramped up? And then I suppose related to that with this full the mill um, project at Boulder, which is uh, East Boulder, which is meant to add 40,000 ounces, does that push it up to 890,000 ounces um, at, at Stillwater? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so it's easy. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the ramp up is still going forward, but as I said, you, you, you can't turn on the productivity day one. There's, there's some costs that we absorb as, as we ramp up, and we're very focused on you know, equipment refreshes. We've got a lot of old equipment, so that goes into the sustaining cost bucket. That was the other thing that I didn't mention, but the, the life of some of our equipment is, is pretty old. And then as we get through those investment stage, we see the, the, uh, the target, targeted ASIC come back down. And East Boulder is completely in addition. It's 40,000 ounces at the moment. There's probably some opportunity to further optimize that, but you know, we've presented the, the project on, on a 40,000. 20,000 of those ounces kick in, in in 2020, and that also shares costs across. But again, with East Boulder, there'll be we talk about 19 million of capital and about 10 million of, of incremental operating costs. Some of that incremental operating cost is bringing those people on to develop um, both the, the primary development, which we capitalize, and the secondary stope access areas that will happen before, obviously, the first ounce comes out. Th thanks a lot. And then, sorry, could I maybe have another one for Shadwick? Um, I know you don't want to give gold production guidance until Section 189 process and the strike is complete. But the targeted shafts, so let's say you close, the, the shafts that are being restructured at Trefontaine and Beatrix, how much do those produce in a normal year? You would have seen in the presentation, we, you'd have seen in the presentation, we referred to about 110 to 140,000 ounces per annum, which is an average over the last two years. Thank you very much. Yeah, and, and just to add on two things there, Patrick, the, um, in a normalized year, no strike, no 189 process, and obviously no um, operational, other anomalous operational disruptions, the gold business plan would look very much like it was last year, you know, in terms of uh, ounces. Yeah, except lower cost, obviously we take cost. Then the other thing I want to say is um, the, the additional 40,000 ounces of, uh, of full the mill, and we haven't given guidance to this, but you can expect, and Chris was firm on the 
the 550 is still in place once you get to the full ramp up should make that actually slightly lower Chris but we don't we would like to retain that flexibility if, if we may okay <laughs> okay Hi, it's Liram Guni from Standard Bank. Um, my first question is, according to your toll treatment arrangement with Anglo Platts, what happens if they have uh, capacity constraints for, um, as a result of load shedding, for example? Does your metal take precedence over theirs? Um, and then my second question is, given where the basket price is at the moment, how much of that do you think is driven by underlying fundamentals and how much of that is just the market concerned about load shedding and potential strikes? Yeah, so, so Rich, if you can pick up the contractual question. I, I don't think the market has yet factored in industrial action in the platinum sector. I think we, we are still, we are still going to see that. and. Uh, and, and we actually very well positioned having a, a North American business that will be, um, let's say, somewhat immune to that. Uh, I also don't think much has been uh, factored into, into the, the ESCOM issues. Um, and, and it's primarily because, uh, and if you heard Chris Griffiths talking uh, on the radio the other day, there is catch-up capacity uh, um, from the load shedding in terms of smelters and so on. Um, but contractually, Rich, can you just pick it up? Yeah, I mean, I think there are obviously a lot of details in that contract which we can't go into. But, but broadly speaking, let, let's say that the risk sharing is equal. Um, what that means to us effectively is that we, in fact, get the benefit of the flexibility Amplats has got of having various different facilities. So we treat through the Rustenburg facility in particular. They obviously have various smelting uh, and refining facilities. If there are any issues at Rustenburg, we do have access to our metal being treated at the other ones as well. Um, I would not say that the contract is specifically designed to give us a preference, but it's certainly not designed that we're at a greater risk either uh, than any other material going through there. So essentially something to a load shedding risk, for example, that's a risk that's shared equally by, by both parties, I think is the best way to explain that. <laughs> Sorry, Neil, I just have a follow-up question. Well, actually, two. Oh, there you are. <laughs> this is for, for Charles. Um, you know, once all the dust settles in gold and, and you know, you've got your restructuring through, what would be the annualized care and maintenance cost you will be incurring at gold? And then just quickly, um, Chris, on your Franco Nevada royalty, could you just ex elaborate what percentage and how that is calculated? Because in your segmental information, there aren't any royalties being paid at still water. Thanks. Why don't you go first, Chris? Uh, look, royalties in the U.S. are very different from the royalties in, in South Africa. So I believe in South Africa they're essentially a, a form of tax. This is a commercial payment that was an agreement that was years and years and years ago. Um, it's roughly around 5%. It's on the vast majority of our, uh, of our um, mining tenements. So the Franco, roughly 5%. At the high 80s, there's a small Moat royalty that's 0.35 percent, but that's on a very small area of the of the mine. And then the other thing that's variable in our all-in sustaining costs is what's called the MMLT. It's a Montana severance tax, which relates to the severance of of, of the minerals. Those taxes and what we call royalties um, go through our our operating costs, cost of goods sold. Chris is saying, obviously ours is more tax-like um, because it's a variable formula, where theirs is a fixed formula. Um, based on the care and maintenance costs, obviously at the majority of it sits at Cook, and you can see that um, you know, it's close on 290 million for this half year. Um, we, we have looked at possible options with the Cook asset. Um, to date, we haven't been extremely successful in that. Um, but what I can say is we are now looking at options of how do we minimize that care and maintenance cost. So we want to pull it right down to, to, you know, it's difficult to say the number at this point in time, but it won't be at the same quantum that we currently have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously with Drefontaine, you know, we, we have to take decisions on certain shelves. Um, and going forward, we have some closure plans for those. 
Hi, Neil. It's Steve Friedman from Renaissance Capital. Just a question. You've shown a few charts talking to your positive leverage in the higher PGM price environment. Um, but, I mean, what's clear is obviously you, you are quite operationally geared, overlaid with financial gearing, and, and now into a year that's continuing on with strike action and potential wage negotiations. The question is, I mean, gearing goes both ways, and what are you doing or are you thinking about risk mitigation strategies, potentially even in a cyclical uh, commodity downturn, um, such as hedging, et cetera, uh, you know, just given that, that, that elevated gearing you have? Yeah. Um. <clears throat> so, so in terms of um, the risk management, um, we 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 clearly look at marginal assets in our um, in 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 approaching a hedge. Um, so, in gold, uh, we we have board approval to hedge up to twenty five percent of our gold, and um, and and we do do that. We're opportunistic in doing that, uh, and we have got a hedging profile. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, um, let's say, palladium and rhodium, well, I don't think you can really hedge uh, rhodium. Palladium, uh, you, you know, there, there are opportunities, but again, we, we are not marginal, um, and even a big downturn in the palladium market uh, would, uh, would not compromise that business. Now, clearly, we, we look at that in, holistically in terms of uh, our debt position as well. Um, but I don't think our shareholders would want us to, to hedge our PGMs uh, at this stage, despite the high leverage, because we've got a, we've got a profile that shows that we will, we will have accelerated deleveraging um, you know, in the not too distant future. Okay. Do we have any questions on the conference call? There's a question from Johan Stein of Citigroup. Thank you very much. Um, hi, guys. Uh, Neil, first of all, I just want to congratulate you guys on a much improved safety performance in the second half. Um, you know, very encouraging, and, and, and congratulations, and I hope this, this carries on. Um, a few questions um, that I just have. First of all, you mentioned that uh, you expect platinum palladium substitution to happen at some point in gasoline vehicles. Um, are there varying you know, views out there when that will happen? And I was interested to hear your view as to when you think this might happen. Yeah, thank you, Jan. I appreciate the compliment. Um, in terms, if we step back a year, we, we actually did some research and, uh, and we have since followed it up. And a year ago, we said that um, you need a, a platinum price a platinum palladium price difference of about 400 to 500 dollars an ounce patrick you would remember that uh, that discussion and um, and at the time with at, i think we were talking maybe a 200 dollar an ounce uh, price difference and we were saying at that at that price difference substitution won't happen um at 500 dollars plus today um there is more talk about substitution from the fabricators uh, and the end users. Um, that's, that's talk. Um, the, the process of actually making decision to, to substitute um, requires engineering testing um, and licensing of, um, of catalysts, and that's probably an 18-month to two-year process. Um, you know, it, it probably can be accelerated, but I think um, we, we still at least uh, 18 months to two years away. Now, now clearly the price of platinum will change uh, before that actually happens. Um, so we're probably not too far away from, from the smart investors starting to, to factor in higher platinum prices. Um, um, but it certainly, it certainly will happen. Thank you. Well, thanks for that. Uh, a quick question for Shaul as well. Um, Shaul, can you just walk us through the past week, please? Um, you guys gave up, uh, up or guidance in, on the 14th of February, um, and, and obviously explain now why that guidance has been revised down. But I'm just interested to know, you know, what, what how was this effectively raised? Why wasn't it picked up earlier? Um, uh, if you can just walk us through some of the, uh, you know, the, the, the issues over the past week. Yeah, thanks, Johan. Obviously, you know, we do put out a trading statement and you've got reasonable certainty on the numbers. Um, when we put it out on 14 February, we were there. 
Um, but obviously, you know, the New Jersey tax change was, was then also brought to our attention, and we just felt that we, we had to basically work through those tax changes, um, and in the end, it did give us the, the revised number. So it was unfortunate that it was such a, you know, a, a, a late change, um, but as I said, at the 14th of February, we had, had pretty much had contract sign-off um, from, from all the regions. But um, obviously, Chris, you know, operating, operating in the U.S., um, did raise a concern and say, guys, you should please look at the New Jersey tax changes. And I said that was obviously then evaluated, and, and we felt prudent then to, to make that adjustment. As I said, we, we did look at some tax planning changes um, in terms of looking at New Jersey, um, but we, we didn't want to preempt where we would end up, and then we conservatively booked that change, Ron. Okay, thanks for that, Char. And then lastly, I know over time, um, uh, probably for James, um, you know, the, 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 the WAC assumptions in that NAV calculation, are those dollar and rand nominal or real cost of capital? It's actually for Richard. <laughs> I, I put the average into the book, but there's a, a, it's a composite of different uh, real uh, interest rates. Okay, so actually the question is, if you look at the 7.5% um, that you using SA operations, is that a RAND nominal WAC? Or, or where do we, what, I just want to understand that WAC, it looks pretty low. Uh, Johan, hi, it's a, it's a RAND real discount. RAND real, okay, okay, that makes sense, okay. Thank you. There are no further questions on the webcast. Okay, we'll take a couple from the webcast. There's quite a few, but uh, a lot of them are quite detailed and technical. I'll respond to those later. So just a couple of high-level ones. Um, does Sabanya have a strategy? This is from David Melville. Does Sabanya have a strategy for developing any new gold mines in, in South Africa? Um, yeah, hi, David. Uh, we, we certainly do. Uh, once our liquidity position, sorry, correction, once our our leverage is at a level that, uh, that allows us to do that. We'd like to develop the Bernstone project. Um, we think that is, uh, that is uh, strategically a, a good project. It's, uh, it's got a large resource, it's shallow, and uh, it can be partially mechanized. So um, that's an obvious project. Uh, depth extensions, well, I think uh, we need to really get much more comfortable that our, our turnaround in safe production um, is, uh, is sustainable. Um, as I said, we have to improve it, um, and, and then it's going to be very dependent on, uh, on let's say, the investment climate uh, in South Africa. But Burnstone is, is an obvious yes. Uh, then I've got a, probably a follow-up on that. Are we going to invest in gold operations in the U.S.? From Bianca Buerta. Yeah, look, we, we like gold, um, but as I've said, to create value, um, you, you, you can't do that when it's a fashion, um, which it seems to be today. Um, we like the U.S. We've been well accepted in the U.S. It's a very nice operating environment, regulatory environment, and it's very investor-friendly. If we could grow our gold business there in a value-accretive way, uh, at the right time, I always want to stress, at the right time, um, we would certainly look to do that. Um, and then a further question from uh, uh, Yiran Lee from Bain Beijing Investment LP. Um, I saw a lot of growth pipeline in Sabania through the DRD gold acquisition, Lonman's uh, uh, expansion at, and potential expansion at Lonman. What is the gearing le level we will see a further step up in investment and how will we allocate it? Yeah, if, if I understand that question properly, um, it relates to basically all the recent questions. I, I think we've always said we want to see our net debt to EBITDA down at one um, before we, we make investment decisions that are going to require um, higher capital. So, so, so that, that, in my mind, is, is, is the simple answer to that. I think the other questions we've pretty much covered, uh, how we would respond to a strike in platinum. I think we've gone through uh, the, the talk in the media of doubling our EBITDA for 2019. I think we've shown how at spot prices and uh, under a st stable operating environment we could possibly do that. 
Um, I think that's most of them. The others I'll follow up on. Yeah, good. Thank you. Thanks, James. Uh, thank you, everybody. I know it's been a long session, but I hope you found it stimulating and interesting. Thank you very much.